All right, everyone, and welcome. You survived to a uh, another Friday. If you're seeing this hubcast, um, well, if you're seeing it live, let's put it that way, then you've absolutely made it to uh, another Friday. So uh, we like to do these things at Friday about 2 o'clock or so because it catches all of the uh, – all of the time zones for the most part um, in the U.S. And uh, so we can uh, uh, at least give you a little bit of uh, sanity on your Friday just before you guys hit your weekend. And I see there's a bunch of people in chat. So, hey, everyone. Um, hey, there's Justin. Peter's here. Megan, of course. Ron, hey, you guys are all here. Awesome. Hey, good to see you guys. Um, so what in the heck is this thing that we do every Friday? Well, we call it our Hubcast. It's our really, you know, it's not. It's not really a, I guess it is a podcast for the most part, but video cast. I don't even know. What's the proper name for that? Anyone even know? I know chat's talking about something totally different right now. They got, they're going on about big Indian or little Indian stuff. Um, but, you know, is it a vlog? It's not really a vlog either, which I hate that word. I don't like the term vlog. It sounds, I don't know, not me. Um, but any, anyhow, so what we'd like to do is we talk um, anything really related to digital investigations um, on, uh, on Fridays. And sometimes it, it goes ri- way off the rails. Um, sometimes it, it doesn't, it stays on topic uh, for the most part. Um, but, uh, and this week is going to be a lot of fun too. I got a, a, a good friend of mine who I've known for a while now on here. Um, and I'll introduce him in just a minute, but I wanted to talk about a, a few things. I'm on here. I guess it could be a live stream, Sam. Yeah. I mean, li- or Megan said it too. video podcast live. Yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> it's, it's what it is. Uh, oh, man, see, I'm glad we, we got on this topic because um, I'm supposed to, according to my daughter again, if you guys watched a couple weeks ago, she's trying to remind me every time to tell everyone to make sure you guys like this and you subscribe to the channel because what it does is just alert you when we go live or when we're planning something or when we push a new video up. We got a couple of good videos that are coming up. Um, I'm hoping to have them done within a week or so. Um, and I know there's a, a, a couple other videos from some uh, some great vendors out there that um, we, we plan on pushing up. And I know uh, Justin, Justin's kind of lurking about in the channel too. Some of his videos have been pushed up um, as well. So uh, we can notify you that way. So if you hit like and subscribe, and it helps on YouTube when people are searching for like digital investigation, digital forensics, things like that, it helps us get found a little bit, a little bit easier because, um, you know, YouTube is a kind of a pay to play type thing. And I'm not a big fan of that, but uh, we have to kind of work the rules as we can work them. So what Cyber Social Hub is, if you've uh, just got an email from us and you don't know what the hub is for certain, it's real simple, right? And it says it, oops, wait, right back here. Actually, it says it in both spots. Um, it's really backwards to me. Um, it's an online community of digital investigators. That's really it, right? Um, because a lot of times how we originally started was, you know, I'd go to all these awesome conferences and hear these amazing speakers and meet some really cool people. And after that, it's over. And it's all gone. And it's like, how do I connect back with people like this? I didn't want the, essentially the the nerd party in my brain to end. So that's why we started uh, Cyber Social Hub up is because that way you can stay connected all the time. It's one place where we don't have to rely on, you know, uh, the, the large social medias and whether they like what we're talking about or not, because some of the things we talk about in the hub are sensitive, right? Because they're investigations, um, especially in the, in the law enforcement community. Um, that we have uh, in there. And, you know, we didn't want anyone to be able to turn the switch on and off. So we created our own community uh, and you can go over, it's a hundred percent free, go, go sign up and, um, you know, uh, take a look at things. I'm going to show you real quick uh, what it is here. I'll jump over to this one and Hey, there's uh, my guest right there. He's kind of, uh, I didn't mean to leave it up on there and give it away, but there, yeah, Mike's coming up here in just a minute. And um, again, it's just a, uh, essentially a social network for digital investigators. You can see as it as it loads up, um, I have some updates that I have to do on this thing, so it's a little bit slow. Hey, Matt posted some awesome uh, Python script here. It looks like to parse out some uh, some iOS uh, SMS stuff. And there it is. Again, free. Um, you can go and you just pull this stuff out. I'm, I'm dying to try this. I haven't had a chance to go and uh, and look at some of these uh, uh, Python scripts that he had, uh, had posted in there. But again, it's just that. It's people talking about real problems, posting real things that are out there, research, so on and so forth. If they f- come across a, a hub ca- or a, a different uh, video cast out there, uh, I like this is Kevin with an, an E, not an I-N. This is an E-N, Kevin. Um, he, po- he was on this uh, uh, dark web investigation thing, and uh, so he posted his, his 
uh, webinar on there, which is awesome. I love re free resources, and that's what we're all about is giving back to the community. I was a digital investigator for many years, and I just didn't know where to go, where to find the information I was looking for. So we just make it available to you. Uh, and again, it's free, and it's not totally free. Obviously, you guys see some awesome sponsors over here in the uh, in the in the right hand column, uh, and they help provide that for us. That uh, it's able to to deliver that that stuff to you guys. One other thing, I know you've heard me talk about it week after week after week, and uh, again, this week will be absolutely no different. Um, we have an iPhone app out, and it is live on the store. Google is giving me some challenges. Not that it's an approval challenge, but it's challenges that I don't know what I'm doing when submitting stuff to the Google Play Store. And I, uh, I got a little assistance because, again, a lot of this we're doing on our own, this submission thing. The Apple Store was fairly easy. I thought that was going to be the hard one. We did it first because we anticipated it being hard, and it ended up being easy. Google's a little bit more challenging, at least in my brain. It, it, it doesn't work like a, a complete developer. So if there's somebody out there, ah, Sam, or somebody who's you know posted to the Google Play Store before that maybe can help us out, that'd be great because I'm having some challenges. But here's our app right down here. And you'll see it's going to load up. It is going to look at Face ID here. So I got to look at this thing. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you can turn Face ID on to make Cyber Social Hub work. And there it is, the exact same thing you saw from Matt. It is in a mobile format. Uh, makes it really easy. Um, to read the stuff on the go. Um, the app looks phenomenal. Uh, really happy with uh, the way everything turned out. There's all of our groups in there. Like if you wanted to talk mobile forensic specific or you wanted to talk OSINT, dark web, whatever, it's it's all right in, in the app here. And yeah, this is me going live. Um, so, and, and everything's right there. So awesome stuff. So I'm done talking about Cyber Social Hub. Uh, we are gonna be at a few places. Um, <laughs> that's a great question, Sam. Sam says, uh, What's the, uh, let me just bring this up here on the, on the screen here, Sam, I'm going to try to find a, a spot to fit you here. There you go. What's the forensic artifacts left by the app? I have no idea. So it sounds like a good research search project for somebody to, uh, to go and tackle. I have no idea what's left behind by our own app. Um, I haven't uh, tore it apart. Um, so I'm going to bring go ahead and bring Mike up here and hopefully I don't uh, mess this up too bad. And <coughs> little things come up. There he is. Hey, Mike, how are you? Hey, how's it going, Kevin? It is going great. Thank you for taking some time out on your on your Friday. I know you got a really like super packed, busy schedule with a, a lot of the um, speaking engagements that you always do. So I appreciate you taking the time out for us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, hey, Mike. Um, you know, I, I know some things about you. I mean, nothing bad, right? Let me let me clarify that because somebody's <laughs> going to be writing down. Well, what did we know about Mike? Um, that you know are pretty interesting, but I guess uh, if you want to give the folks a little bit of your background and who you are and what you do, um, and what we're looking for is how you got started. And I know you got a great story behind this, and I've heard it a couple of times, but I don't want to mess it up by uh, by uh, by saying it. But go ahead and tell your story of how you got started in cybersecurity originally. Yeah. Um. At the time, I was uh, playing in a, uh, a heavy metal band, and uh, we were touring, awesome. we had a record, we had music videos, and uh, we all know what happened uh, at the end of the, the 80s, and uh, our careers sort of imploded, and um, I took a job in IT, and ended up working at um, the NASDAQ stock market uh, in security. And uh, while I was there, um, you know, great organization and, and, and all, but while I was working there, I was always one of those folks that was really intrigued by new tools and things. And granted, you know, I'm dating myself now. This is probably like 1993. Um, I was a Unix system administrator and an Oracle DBA. And uh, at the time, um, you know, there was tools, uh, including, you know, open source tools, even at that time that were being released. And one of them, uh, believe it or not, of all names was called Satan, uh, which was like a security uh, analysis tool, one of the first vulnerability scanners out there long before there were things like Nessus or other things. And I said, wow, this would be great for testing all our Unix platforms. We've got Solaris, we got SGI, we got HPUX, all these different Unix flavors. And so I downloaded it and ran it, you know, on the network. Uh, on the the servers on the trading floor in the middle of the trading day and uh, um, took down the stock market by accident. So, <laughs> um, That's a great know, fortunately, story. Every time I love hearing it, man. It's like, you know, 
if you achieve things by complete accident, you know, that some organizations in the world would love to attempt to achieve and you did it yeah. really by a mistake. <laughs> yeah, it was a true case in, you know, what not to do, right? And <laughs> so, um, so fortunately, you know, NASDAQ was doing, you know, um, virtualization long before the, the term was even coined, right? And so everything failed over like it was supposed to, to the backup location. And uh, there were really no hiccups, no trades lost or anything as a result of it. Um, it was a good way to test the DR, right? <laughs> so, um, so I was called into uh, the CISO's office, although back then they didn't call him a CISO. Uh, and he said, you know, Mike, I'm, I'm here to offer you one of two options. You're either fired or you can take a promotion. <laughs> and so I couldn't exactly go home to my wife and tell her I'd been fired. So I took the promotion and asked questions later. But he essentially said, listen, you know, we, we need to build out a more formal, you know, security team, cybersecurity team here uh, at NASDAQ. And I'd love to have you head that up. You clearly demonstrated you can take down the network. Now it'll be your job to protect it. And that was how I got into cybersecurity. <laughs> That is, again, one of the best stories I've heard uh, in the industry by far. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's so great. Um, so, <laughs> um, and it's, it's good. You didn't get fired, really. Yeah, everything worked well. And, you know, a little, we call that creative writing 101, right, is when you have to write the report. Well, really, I was testing the fail safe to make sure everything <laughs> rolled over as the way it should have. <laughs> right. I just did it at a wrong time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so great. So, you know, what brings you to, and you're with Silent Signals. Um, so what are you guys doing over at Silent Signals? What kind of projects are you working on over there? Yeah, so Chet Hosmer and myself have been friends for a very long time, I think going on almost 25 years now. And um, we've always collaborated on research uh, long before we joined forces. Um, we had many presentations at RSA, uh, DEF CON, a variety of different conferences out there, um, just exposing all different types of research, open source tools and things that we had been authoring, uh, many of which were focused around DFIR and around, you know, forensics and, mm -hmm. and incident response and things like that. So, so we um, uh, decided a few years back, um, we had some some really cool creative ideas and the timing was right too because we're both normally very busy as you said we're normally traveling all over the universe and you know doing a thousand things at once and so uh, we formed this organization uh silent signals to really um uh start to kind of further explore and and actually productize some of the things that we're you know creating uh one of those was focused around uh, fake image analysis. Uh, Chet and I have a long history uh, in steganography, steganalysis, um, analysis of different types of image and video formats, and um, really found a creative way in which we can uncover, you know, uh, fake images and, you know, disinformation and, and you know, AI uh, generated, you know, fake portions to these types of media. And um, we decided we would, you know, uh, present it at DEF CON, um, the, you know, interest was overwhelming. We walked into a room that should have had about 30 people and it was over 800 and they had to close the doors and shut down the street literally, uh, so we could, you know, present, uh, and, um, you know, from that peaked interest, we, you know, decided to, uh, provide it as a product to organizations and, and it's something we do today. And as an extension of that, you know, of course, social media feeds a lot of that disinformation. So we, um, have gotten deeper into OSINT. We've always done aspects of OSINT, uh, but we've also gotten into certain types of OSINT tools and things that we've authored too. Also with help from you too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that was, it was funny how it all started with this kind of a little tinker of like, what was the, I'm gonna do with the rest of my life? And uh, I spewed out some, uh, some code that was, uh, uh, some other people had already been working on piecing stuff together. We just refined it just a little bit and then you and Chet took it and man, it's just amazing now. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's awesome. I'm excited to see the, the latest iteration of things, um, that are out there. So I guess, um, the, the biggest thing here is, um, you'd mentioned the rock band. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, I'm going to switch back and forth. How long did you, how long did you do this heavy? It was heavy metal. Not really, not really the rock genre. I know people are like, Oh, it's all sure. Weird. No, it's not. It's definitely not the same. Uh, <laughs> how long did you do that? 
Um, well, I'd always played uh, since I was a kid. And um, once I got out of uh, college, you know, kind of I, I played in a few bands in college. And then after I got out, um, started to do it part time while I was working full time. And we would play out at clubs. We would travel around a bit in support of, you know, um, uh, the record, you know, things like that. And, um, uh, you know, our big break really was we showed up for an open mic night and found out it was a big battle of the bands for Washington, D.C., and they said we could have the slot. So we took it, we played, we won. Nice. Uh, and then we, we came back for the final battle off a, a few weeks later. Uh, and we won that too. So we just thought wow. it was bragging rights, but that's how we got a record deal. That is freaking amazing. That is so yeah. awesome. And the question, so. everyone's everyone's on mine. And I saw it go through in chat. I don't know if you're, if you're monitoring uh, chat or not here. But uh, Sam says he's just recovering a little bit from the mental picture of you in a hairband. So the, the real question <laughs> is, number one, was there a mullet involved in any point? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was much longer than a mullet. I mean, okay. I definitely had uh, hair down to my waist. And as you can see, there's not much of that left. Um, <laughs> that's what happens when you get old. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, definitely, uh, you know, lots of hair. Um, lots of lightning bolts, lots of, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So <laughs> that's so <laughs> awesome. So that was, it was way beyond Molly. You were like into the true, like rock hair at that point. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Most so of it gone now, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what year was this? Oh gosh, this was, um, probably from like 1987 to 1993. Okay. All right. So my next question is. Um, because I went to, to see, you know, the, wow, well, I wouldn't really call him rock. I, mean, I guess Cinderella was right in that kind of that mm -hmm. weird genre between pop and rock. I don't know the crossover stuff, but you know, they had the big hair going on too. part of the eighties. Was that part of your deal as well? Or was it just straight hair down the back? You know, mostly straight hair down the back. Right. We're a little bit more <laughs> ACDC oriented, right. right? So good, yeah, good. you, you wouldn't point to my book for that. Cause <laughs> the hair bands, man, were just an interesting <laughs> thing. You look back at it and, you know, I was like at the time, I didn't really notice like bands like Cinderella and you know, Bon Jovi stuff. How were the, the, yeah, like my hair, my sister used to wear almost the same kind of hair. Uh, but mm -hmm. so, yeah, kudos. You, you win points for not having that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, in other words, I didn't, I didn't own a bottle of hairspray. Right. So. <laughs> Right. That's the important <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> so awesome. So how many guitars do you have now? Do you still keep a, a pretty big uh, collection of them? Yeah, too many. Um, I've got at least a dozen. I yeah. see you eyeballing around I, the I, room, so it's like you're scanning uh, back there. Right, exactly. I know. I had to take it all in. But I do have a lot of flying bees. I'm a, a big collector of flying bees. Oh, so. really? Uh, it would be so awesome. I should have had you grab one down and... Uh, and prep it up for the show but i didn't think about oh it. yeah totally i'm thinking of like hanging them behind me you know yeah. i've had like um and i've actually set like different guitars as my backgrounds i should have done that for the show today but um I, yeah absolutely maybe in the though. future yeah. We'll, yeah we'll plug you into some type of uh amp and and, and a way to input sound in, into the show and we'll go from there sure <laughs> that'd be really cool <laughs> so, <laughs> so um you know i don't want to um i'm sorry I'm, I'm getting distracted by uh by chat here um, back and forth to see if there's anything. Oh, real quick. Also, if you guys have a question for Mike at any time, whether it pertains to at what point does it not become a mullet to actual real digital investigation type questions, when you put it into chat, make sure you put a Q and then a colon. Um, and that's why, because what I'll do is I can take the chat like with the software that we use here um, and filter it down and I can see it. And here, I don't think, I don't, I think I may have shown this once on the show before. But I will, uh, I'll show you guys how, what I see um, here for the show. It's a little insane, and so just bear with me. Here's, here's everything that I see, right, um, and for the show. It, it's a lot happening. You see like three or four windows going on of moving um, because there's a preview, there's the live show window, then there's the interview, how we're actually attached to the, to the system. Um, yeah, it's all pretty crazy. Um, but that way... Um, you know, all the chat appears over here for me and I can see, uh, uh, I can filter it down, uh, pretty, pretty easily, um, when we do that. So yeah, there you go. So that's the, the crazy software that we use here. Uh, it's called the Ecamm. If everyone's ever interested in being totally nerd out, nerded out, cause uh, I enjoy it. <clears throat> Absolutely do. Um, so Mike, you've been watching a lot of, um, 
uh, kind of the information lately that's been coming out in the news. Is that right? Yeah, we've been doing a lot of um, research uh, around the Ukrainian war. Um, you know, we've got some tools that do a lot of like situational awareness, geolocation type things, leveraging OSINT methods. And um, for the last, gosh, I guess since around late February, um, been collecting on an ongoing basis, a plethora of data around the, the Ukrainian war. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, th there's been a lot of interesting data and a lot of like data correlations we've made. So it's been quite interesting um, to track um, anything from tanks to um, various buildings or churches or things that have been bombed and starting to track the geolocation of those things to actually track um, the movements of a lot of these Russian troops. Hmm. Um, and so it's been really, really interesting, you know, the kind of data we've been gathering, um, but also, you know, the, the subset of data that we've vetted out is sort of disinformation. You know, I know there was another one today uh, that was highly publicized around uh, a Russian ship that was uh, destroyed, which was actually uh, determined to be fake news um, from a few, it was actually a ship from a few years back. Um, but there's a lot of different ways in which that can be approached. And we've got some unique ways in which we then take um, the videos and the images and run them through our fake analysis tool to kind of vet them out to for legitimacy and things like that. So, oh, that's awesome. And yeah, because um, I, I know this has been kind of top on your mind this last uh, gosh, it's been well over a month now. Uh, all the stuff that's uh, that's going on and the, the data that you guys are uh, are collecting over there. How do you um, I, I guess without getting too deep in the weeds, I, I guess as far as you want to go is, you know, sure. how do you get some of the information? Where does it come in? Is it all social media or do you use, utilize other sources um, for this? We predominantly focus on social media. Um, we don't focus on other aspects like deep web, dark web, or things like that. I know there's a lot of people that, that focus on those areas. Not to say I haven't done that in the past, I have, but what we're doing right now is a lot of uh, more OSINT you know, focused and mm -hmm. the, the source of that tends to be a lot of social media feeds, things like that. Um, there's a lot of different APIs, scrapers, other things that you can leverage to gather that data. What we're trying to do is you know, one of the systemic problems across social media today, especially with the large social networks, is that um, there's a huge lack of metadata um, because it gets wiped typically by the social networks as it's posted. Yeah. But there are certain types of um, APIs you can still leverage to kind of geolocate from where posts are being posted from. And if you mash up all that data, you can start to get a general location uh, either for an individual or situational awareness around a particular, you know, location. So you can build like a bounding box from the data or leverage a bounding box in terms of, hey, I want to collect the data for this region. So whether it be Kiev or some of the other areas around the Ukraine where, you know, um, there's a high level of war activity going on, uh, we've been able to like leverage that data to collect it more live rather than post-mortem. And that gives us a lot of geolocated data and furthermore, um, a lot of situational awareness because normally when you um, look for that data, for example, within Twitter um, and you're leveraging the APIs, you only get a subset of it. It's a limitation of the APIs. And then right. furthermore, um, one of the other challenges um, that you can run into is that um, there are filters within Twitter too that you know, once the data is posted, shortly thereafter, it may get taken down. So we're collecting it live before it's taken down. So we're getting some real key critical data and sharing it with uh, a few media uh, sources ourselves um, that want some of that data. Yeah, I remember when I was initially doing some research on what you had just talked about back in, I think it was, um, and it's been several years now, um, there was a um, I think a gunman in the Fort Lauderdale airport, I think is where it was. And I was mm -hmm. going and capturing the, the live data. And then I went back to try to capture some historical data um, to try to validate, to match up, um, or maybe something I had missed. And then what I noticed is Twitter's literally, they stopped anything in that geo within a certain mm -hmm. time to a time. They just block that whole thing out and didn't give you access to that it would jump from one time to the next completely missing mm -hmm. anything that may have happened when that event is so that 
what you guys are doing is 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 really good because it allows you again to to not have to worry about having to go back and recollect it. It and it may not be there. You may be out of right. Yeah, you kind of avoid those blind spots. Um, is sort of an extension of other research we've done uh, more around uh, physical awareness, whereby we all know you know our, our mobile devices and things between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and other things are exposing ourselves as being within the vicinity. Mm -hmm. You may not know who owns that device, but a device has been observed. So if a, um, an event occurs, uh, like we saw with Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas, for example, right. you know, and the attacker there, right, you know, it's been publicized, they were able to use, you know, uh, physical awareness type information around the scenario, um, and actually capture uh, the guy and, you know, what his devices had been communicating unbeknownst to him, which helped them kind of track his location. Um, so there's a lot of cool and interesting, you know, ways in which you can leverage that data for, you know, physical awareness, situational awareness, um, building out, um, you know, a chronological timeline of the data, a lot of something people are referring to now as chronology, uh, where you can you know, take all of that data and put it in a specific chronological order and, mm -hmm. and then get additional data from that. Like, for example, we mentioned earlier, like the movement of Russian troops. So if I can, you know, gather a bunch of images around a variety of tanks, categorize them based on the serial numbers on the sides of them, can I then, you know, see where I saw that tank at different times to track in what direction is that tank going and thus where might the troops attack next? So, and you can, we leverage um, more sophisticated tools too that incorporate um, optical character recognition. So you can do those matches, um, but we also use various forms of recognition. So if we're profiling a person um, of interest, we can actually, you know, load that image um, and then have it tell us like of the 10,000 images we collected, did you see that person anywhere else? And more times than not, you know, our human analysis doesn't see that, right? Um, but, you know, with the, the automation we leverage in the cloud for doing that analysis, you know, it picks up on it in a matter of a fraction of a second, right? And we get a subset of 10 images that say, wow, I not only saw this individual in Kiev, but I saw them elsewhere too. Sure. That, and that's pretty amazing um, to, to be able to do that. Because I know uh, without giving too much away that you were involved in being able to, uh, you've had a lot of work in, in wireless technologies, let's put it that way, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, in the past, which is freaking spooky but i love it it's that kind of st the stuff that uh, a lot of the reason i got into this field in the, in the first place and uh, and you were right there on the cutting edge of a lot of that um which is just amazing um so again thanks for sharing a lot of this with us and i'm, I'm trying to be careful not to talk anything that we're not supposed to be chatting about with uh with this. yeah no i mean like on the wireless side yeah i've done a lot of research in, in that area too so when you think about drones or other things that you want to track um you know how do I, you know, how do I discover that, right? We all know that there's, um, you know, all kinds of tools out there for doing wireless analysis, but it's how you take that data and make something meaningful from it right. that helps you vet that out. So, you know, there are things like one of the examples, you know, is, you know, if you take a look at the MAC address exposed by the Wi-Fi, whether it's connected to a Wi-Fi network or simply passive, uh, you can, you know, actually look at, uh, the beginning or the first three octets of that to get the manufacturer. And um, you can do matches like that to vet out like, okay, I, I identified, you know, 10 Wi-Fi devices in the area, but one of them was definitely a drone. And I know that from the first three octets of the MAC address. Um, so, you know, done research, more sophisticated research even than that. But it's just one of the ways in which if you have a wireless sniffer, you know, constantly running on a regular basis, you can actually use it to identify when a drone is present. That's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the applications just for that piece alone um, are, I mean, unlimited really to to be able to identify um, the signals in the area if they're not physically attached to to the AP or anything like that. You can still determine what they are based off of that information that they're they're pushing out in the airwaves, right? That's right. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, very cool, very cool stuff. Um, so tell us a little bit um, about um, some of the other things that you do. I know 
that it may be a little known fact to some other people. <laughs> when I lean back in my chair, my kind of brace is like, what's he going to bring up next? <laughs> uh, I won't. I may bring up the ice cream incident that was in Park City, but maybe not. Um, and and uh, <laughs> uh, but you also brew your own beer, right? Are you are you still doing that? Um, I do that here and there as I have time. Um, but yeah, I do. Um, so uh, I've been a home brewer for gosh, maybe fifteen years now, and um, my flagship brew is a Kona Coffee Stout, um, which was um, my own recipe from a whiskey barrel stout that I'd actually botched. So um, I was with my brewing club. We we're out outside on a Saturday brewing and tasting each other's beers from the last brewing session. And um, I was making a whiskey barrel stout. And um, when I got home, um, I had the war, I had all that stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, you get like a, a bag of chips that you put in cheesecloth and you boil it, right, to kind mm -hmm. of sterilize it. And then you take that and you put that in the carboy, uh, you know, um, to let it ferment with that. And that's how you get that, you know, whiskey barrel stout kind of flavor from the chips of a old whiskey barrel. Right. But um, I had boiled it and it just turned into a bunch of slivers of wood, which obviously is not good for drinking. Um, so <laughs> so I, I contacted my mentor at the time and he said, um, well, you know, you just got back from Hawaii. You were telling me you got some Kona coffee. He's like, brew that up and put it in it, you know. So. Um, so I did, uh, and I shared it, you know, the next month with the the group and they were like blown away and told me, you know, like you really need to enter this in the competition. So we, so I did and got like runners up people choice awards for greater Atlanta, you know, oh, at wow. that time for, for that recipe. So, uh, and then what was really wild was, um, I was asked to, uh, um, apply for uh, you brew your own magazine. Um, they have a contest every year uh, mm -hmm. for the logo. Um, and the, like I had people reach out to me about, you know, the beer and wanting to clone what I had created and, and stuff. So anyways, long story short, um, applied for the brew your own magazine and got highlighted uh, on the inside cover um, around, you know, uh, the logo, you know, Hacker Brewing and like everything that, you know, I'd been working on. So it was pretty <laughs> crazy. So sometimes things just happen, right? So that's so great. Yeah. I mean, how did yeah. you explain that? Yeah, I originally didn't do so well on this. Did you put that? Was that actually in the article that, you know, it was um, it, called? It wasn't. No, they, they, the article was a little bit more focused on um, it was like a logo contest for your, your home brewing. So you would create kind okay. of your own logo and then gotcha. a name for your beer and things like that. So I created like a, a custom label for the bottle. And that's kind of what won. But then people were inquisitive about like, what is this Kona coffee stout? I want to learn more about that, you know? So just kind of had offline conversations about that. So. Oh, very cool. So it wasn't called Splinter and it wasn't anything to do with wood chips. It was all about the- Yeah, fortunately uh, I didn't have to have Splinter in the name, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still very cool. <laughs> uh, so back to the back to the OSINT um, side of things, with identifying, you know, I, I, gosh, how do I want to lead into this? It's, you know, I run into this all the time when I was doing investigations. And a lot of times it wouldn't even occur to me as an investigator, you come across an image and you come across a video and, you know, back then we didn't worry about, or maybe it was just me that didn't worry about so much. It's like, do we didn't have to question, is this a fake image? Is it, you know, does the video been altered? Was it, um, you know, I, I just saw one, um, and I think I sent it to you a couple of weeks ago with um, uh, the president of the Ukraine. It was really bad, though. I, we will admit that um, an AI video, essentially, of uh, Zelensky. And how, mm -hmm. do you, how do you deal with all of that, uh, that type of information and kind of some of the techniques that you guys use to determine whether it's a real video or completely altered, doctored? What, what kind of stuff? Yeah, do yeah. Um, it, the the um, the approach or the analysis is, is different um, between what we do for an image versus a video. And some of those traditional approaches involve whether you look at the aspects of the metadata, um, you look for Photoshopped characteristics, you look for those miscolored eyes and things like that between, you know, how things are generated via AI. And, th and that's helpful and that's good. Um, what we started out with in terms of images was to um, break the image down into bite-sized chunks and look at it um, a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail to find anomalies. And um, we've presented this at a few conferences uh, over the years because um, I think we kind of 
the genesis behind this was probably six or seven years ago. Um, but uh, by breaking it into little bite sized chunks and comparing, you know, parallel, you know, pixels and things like that, able to uh, uh, identify kind of the lack of smoothing techniques that are used by video that are used by um, even, you know, uh, a camera, you know, when you take a picture. Um, and it's, you know, those, those anomalies that we're able to kind of point that out on images. You can even see them on our site. We've got a few examples on the Silent Signals uh, website uh, where you'll see little white, uh, little yellow dots, you know, scattered about where all the anomalies are. And if we see a cluster of those anomalies or yellow dots, it tells us that there's a high probability that this. Uh-oh, I think I lost Mike. Uh, or I lost myself. One of the two. Um, oh, oh, you're back. You're back. I lost you oh, for okay. a second. You froze up, so you're back. Good. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool, cool. I don't know if it was my yeah, end so or your end, uh, you know, the world of internet. Um, I'm watching the bandwidth yeah. meters run here, and everything seems, seems to be okay on this side. But uh, Okay, cool. Sam, cool. Or Sam says you uh, uh, you stepped on your uh, your Wawa pedal there. Um, yeah, yeah, I probably did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, so what we do is um, just to kind of backtrack maybe ten seconds. You know, we we take a look at um, those anomalies. We I when we mark them in the image as like a yellow dot, and if we see large clusters of yellow dots, it shows us that there's a lot of anomalies in that image. Um, you can see those on our Silent Signals website that we just have some examples from the conferences and stuff. Um, and then, you know, from there, um, it can pick up on a variety of anomalies. Like, for example, we we had a, um, a fake image that I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe it was posted on CNN and then identified later as a fake image years back of a of a picture that included Putin and Trump. Um, but uh, doing the analysis of it with our tool, and this is actually what we showed at DEF CON, um, was that um, those were two different, you know, heads that were, you know, put into, you know, an image. Um, and because we could see where they were merged based on the anomalies, we could, we could show that, you know, it, overall it was a fake image that someone had generated it, you know, to, to inspire disinformation. Um, that said, when we did the deeper analysis, we found other anomalies on the in the image, which was kind of hilarious. So when we did the demo at DEF CON, um, people were raising their hands and they said, you know, why does Putin have a bunch of yellow dots around his eyes? And when we looked into it, like after the show, we actually determined that uh, that was because uh, he wears contacts. So his eyes, yeah. um, he, he uses color enhancing contacts. Um, so the 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 product or the tool that we that we demonstrated at DEF CON was, was sensitive enough to pick that up. The other thing that was kind of humorous was uh, we saw clusters of yellow dots around Trump's front teeth. And we're like, why is that? And then we later found out, you know, doing research on that, that he has two caps on his on his front teeth. So it was sensitive enough to pick up on those anomalies, too. Um, no so kidding. it was kind of interesting, the approach, you know, in taking that, that it actually picked up on some of those other characteristics. Yeah, no, that is, uh, that is really cool that it was able to, to actually be that sensitive. Um, so how do you, I guess, I know people are going to ask, or at least they're thinking and not just asking in chat here. And, and mainly a lot of the questions I ask is because I really don't know is how do you, how do you teach the system to identify these, these things and to, to be able to recognize this because, you know, the, the AI that most people are exposed to, we hear this term being used a lot and it's not really AI, right? It's more of an, if this, then mm -hmm. that type scenario. And, you know, you see, I just posted one, I think it was this morning, yesterday morning about mm -hmm. uh, an iRobot that ate uh, a sleeping woman's hair on it. And it, then the next scene was like the Terminator. It's like, it started, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> at what yeah. point does, does AI really become AI uh, versus some of the other stuff? And, and how do you, how do you, how do you teach it these elements to look for? Yeah, um, it's a it's a really good question. It does require a, a lot of um, a, you know a, a big corpus of data, like a big corpus of image images. Um, there are a lot of um, you know uh, repositories, things like that out there that you can use to do that supervised you know training for machine learning to refine how the tool is going to analyze those images. Um, uh, and, uh, another important characteristic, of course, when, when doing that training is, 
um, knowing first in advance what images are real in, in another corpus of data around the images that are fake and being able to properly train it, then going back and, and tracking the accuracy at which it did that. More from a, an image standpoint specifically, you know, traditionally a lot of people, you know, I'm sure there's a variety of forensic people, you know, on, on this, uh, um, you know, YouTube uh, in, in cyber social, you know, interview here. And, you know, you can look at lots of characteristics in terms of histograms, hue, wavelet ratios, and all kinds of other things, right? Um, and and that, that's important, but it's also correlating that to anomalies and leveraging something like machine learning to kind of vet that out. In terms of like AI generated, you know, I think there is a, a blur there between AI versus computer generated and kind of, you know, where do you define the line there? You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good you know, question. Yeah. I think like fundamentally when you think about, um, did somebody just Photoshop the image or did they truly use some level of AI and intelligence to let, you know, um, the AI actually, you know, adjust and, and create that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, you know, that, that, you know, artificial intelligence becomes a, uh, a, a bigger ingredient in terms of how it's generated, but you don't necessarily need AI to find the anomalies, right? Um, just because it's been generated with AI doesn't mean you attack it with AI to determine whether or not it's fake or real, right? We can use um, more sophisticated analysis around comparing um, um, the data in the video or, or the image. So if it's a video, one of the, the things that we do is we break it down into individual images mm -hmm. and then we look at it from an image standpoint, right? So that's one thing you can do almost like a old school video from the twenties, right? Where you have the, the tape rolling and there's, you know, it's a series of pictures, right? right? And you're just playing it fast and it looks like a video. We're just kind of doing the reverse of that, right? We're taking that digital video, breaking it down into high quality images and looking at the individual images themselves. Not to say that's all that we do. We have some other video analysis type uh, techniques that we do too, but that's one of the, one of the things that we do. So then we can kind of look at it the way we do with images. And again, you know, we've got a few examples out there from presentations we've done and things like that. Um, like for example, you know, we did an analysis of, um, a, a pilot, um, doing a selfie at 35,000 feet. So he's hanging out of the front window of the plane while it's flying at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, that's a fake image, but determining, you know, how it's a fake image and actually zooming in and, and, you know, looking at adjacent pixels and trying to find anomalies with those is where we're able to colorize it in the second image you show there, where, although it's small, there's a bunch of yellow dots there that kind of vets out based on the, the base image versus what may have been overlaid on it or AI generated and incorporated into it to find those anomalies. Couldn't find my button to get uh, get get us back here. Hold on, I'm trying to. There we go. Go go. No worries. Good to go. There we go. All right. I'm uh, I, I'm messing in a live environment, and I, and I shouldn't be with all these buttons here. I'm like, ooh, let's, let's push this one because I know what what exactly Mike's talking about. It was already up on the screen. Let me go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, and I know people couldn't really see a whole lot of these. Uh, and these were the yellow dots that you were referring to. Actually, this is the uh, the image. That I'm I'm just jumping to your website here. Um, and I'm sure. going to leave your, um, let me make sure I can jump over here. Uh, generally. Okay. Make sure your audio. Yep. I can still hear you. So this is that image you were, you were talking about, right? With, uh, uh, it Putin, is Putin's eyes here. Um, and you can't really see this one. I don't want to, I don't have my magic mouse on me. I'm using a regular mouse for this one, but you can, there's definitely some here on, on his teeth. I, I don't think you can see my mouse actually being on the screen, but on, on Trump's teeth as well. So, yeah, yeah, um, it, it is a little small, but you can see the cluster of uh, anomaly dots between Putin and Trump. Um, if you actually look at the smaller, you know, picture that covers more area, it's more definitive. Um, but in that second image, yeah, you can see the cluster of dots on Putin's eyes, which means there was an anomaly. And as we found later, that was actually, you know, uh, his colorized uh, contacts. And then Trump, um, if you can zoom in on the teeth, you have to zoom in a lot, I think, on this picture. Yeah, I don't but know the that I can go pictures, anymore. I'm yeah. just doing a standard yeah. double tap in uh, on my Mac mouse here, yeah. my Magic Mouse. The, um, it, on this page at the very bottom is um, a presentation we did actually through Cyber Social Hub about a year and a half ago at Christmas time. Oh, yeah. That has the, Cyber Social the, the, then. Kind of, 
Yeah, um, actually has the raw images. Oh, I'm sorry, this one was from DEF CON, um, but it has the, the raw images in it, so you can see them in more detail. And that's where you can see the dots around uh, Trump's teeth, you know, where he has the two caps in the front, things like that. It shows you the, the level of sensitivity there um, that oh, okay. you can kind of drill into. Yeah. Very cool. I'm going to post this link. So if people want to go and, uh, and check that out, they can. Now, obviously, it's right to this page, what, uh, what, what I was just showing there. Um, but, um, you know, you guys can, uh, can click and, and then you can get full access to your, to your site um, that's out there. Um, now you got a, a quite a few offerings going on on, on the website, right? Um, oh, wait, someone has a question here, and I don't want to miss this because, you know, the, uh, the person in me says this here. Uh, and the question was, how does one purchase FIATS or the fake image analysis testing script? How, do, how does one, the uh, best way is probably just to reach out to you um, and yeah. go that route? Yep. Um, we're uh, currently at the tail end of our beta right now. Um, so if you want to test it for free, uh, you can just reach out to me at mike at silentsignals.com. Uh, and more than happy to uh, provide a uh, a link to you where you can you can download it and try it out. And uh, uh, we'll be offering soon the option to uh, to purchase the more full blown product, which has uh, even you know more features you know available in it. Um, so uh, and and then there should be um, uh, some presentations out there. One of which you highlighted earlier from DEF CON, and uh, happy to share other information too if if you're interested. Um, and then, like you said, there are a few other tools out there. We, uh, um, as you mentioned, we, we've got some OSINT stuff. You inspired us with one of the original ones being uh, the Geo OSINT tool um, that leverages the ability to use um, uh, Twitter to do geolocation of Twitter posts. So whether you have a person of interest or you want to uh, do situational awareness around a, a hurricane uh, in a particular city or um, Kiev in the Ukrainian war or whatever, the geo OSINT tool will allow you to collect uh, tweets and images and video and emojis and a whole variety of things we have in the product uh, to do that kind of activity. That's also um, in late stages of beta and we'll be releasing that soon as a product too. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal uh, to be able to do that because I mean, you know, you heard a lot in, in, you know, any issues that you might have, we should just have Elon Musk on the, on the show because we, we think he's going to own Twitter anyway, right here. And maybe. <laughs> right. Yeah, weeks. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll just we'll just ask him directly. Hey, we really want this capability. Can we do this, please? <laughs> and, and it's kind of ironic, right? Because I think it was maybe about a month ago uh, he was offering to this guy to um, uh, pay for a tool he had written that was doing OSINT and to take it down, right? He offered him, I think, $5,000 or something. I don't know, don't quote me, but um, he was using it to kind of, um, as sort of a person of interest kind of analysis of Musk as he was traveling. And he was leveraging, you know, some of the Twitter APIs to do that kind of thing and, really? and was tracking where Musk was going and then posting his, Musk's location, not definitively on this city block, but it looks like he's in this city and now he's back in the US. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, and so, uh, um, and he's still running that tool today, uh, despite <laughs> the fact that Musk offered him some money to, you know, for it and to take it down. So is my knowledge anyways. Yeah. So. Five thousand. I mean, it wasn't the what's what's the thing for Twitter? Wasn't it like forty some billion? It was billions. I mean, crazy amounts. Of yeah, it was at forty three billion, and the something. the share price. Um, there's a story behind the share price he was offering. I don't quote me, but I think it was fifty two dollars and forty cents. And if you read the the backstory behind that, that's a, that's quite interesting too. So, I did not read the the backstory about the price. I just thought it was higher than the current price that it was. Uh, so yep. I was like, hmm, should I buy some Twitter stock? You just, you know, <laughs> didn't have the inside information on it. Oh, he said, oh, that's what uh, Sam says that's it. Uh, uh, about it right there. Um, it's a exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is Elon Musk's famous uh, uh, appearance on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, which is much better mm -hmm. than mine, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I think he got into a little trouble for doing that little bit of 420 on, uh, on Rogan's uh, <laughs> show live <laughs> yeah that's pretty funny um but yeah i mean you guys to, to me and i know you mentioned the term bounding box and you know i know uh, we know what that is but in case someone doesn't know what a bounding box is they used to now i think they've switched to and, and you may be able to correct me on this or we may have to actually drag chet on the show uh, to clarify in some of the deeper the code part of it 
But the bounding box is essentially just a box, an actual rectangle shape. It can be any kind uh, around a, a geolocation on a map, right? Isn't mm -hmm. that's what it is? And the that's right. It, it's points, um, and it used to be like if you're looking at the map. I'm going to do this the Kevin Dumb way here. Um, and it used to be uh, the lead geo point used to be the lower left, and then the, the other one was the upper right. Um, and I think they've switched at like all four points at this point now, right? So, that, so they can draw really bizarre ones at this point. Is that right? Yeah, in a way. And and it incorporates the fact that we all know the earth is round, right? So, <laughs> so you know, when you when you do that, right, you're, you don't really have a perfect square, right? right, right. Um, especially when you have a large radius. So um, what you can do is um, pinpoint a longitude and latitude um, and then specify basically uh, how large of a radius you want to have around that point. So it could be um, five miles, it could be a hundred miles. So we'll we'll take, for example, the longitude and latitude of Kiev, right? And then mm -hmm. we'll say, uh, give me all tweets within a 10 mile radius. Um, and then you'll collect all posts um, that uh, that people are, are posting along with any kind of images, videos, uh, all of that information so that you know those were posted from those regions. You don't know 100% that the, the image posted is exactly from that region, mm. but with the other tools we have around recognition, we can say, yep, that church that was targeted is in Kiev and it's at this location. You know, So it does, it has some really valuable data to it. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's, that's one thing you have to consider just because something's posted from a specific place doesn't mean that that image is from there. And and I know you had alluded, or yeah, not alluded, you just flat out said that, you know, a lot of the metadata strips, so that's uh, some of the challenges with dealing with some of the misinformation, um, because mm -hmm. we've seen so much. It's it's ridiculous the amount of uh, information or misinformation that's coming out of the Ukraine right now. Yeah, I mean, I know one of the ones you shared with us, um, you know, uh, the president uh, was holding up a sign, right? The hmm. president of the Ukraine was holding up a sign, um, but I saw like at least 100 different variants of that sign. Right. And so it was kind of like, which one is the real one? Right. Yeah. You know, um, so, you know, being able to kind of vet that out and rule out that the majority of those images were clearly fake and altered, you know, um, certainly is important. Yeah, uh, for sure. And it, it, it's just so much. And obviously, the Ukraine is the one that I'm seeing the most on on Twitter. I follow a lot of the, the, the people trying to, you know, uh, as you had mentioned, they, you know, a picture of a tank was in one spot and, you know, it moves over to another or in, in, in even your own in investigation. I, I think that was actually you and I talking uh, one week about how, um, and again, I don't want to get in too much, but how you can uh, determine the movements of these based off of some of the intelligence that you're, you're getting in. I think that was broad enough where I'm safe and I'll let yeah. you elaborate on it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and if you kind of cluster those based on on posting, right, you can get a pretty good idea in chronological order where all these tanks kind of are. Mm -hmm. The other thing that the OSINT community has been doing and, and people are doing posts knowing that this is being crowdsourced is um, I've seen, for example, I was tracking a lot of churches because um, a lot of them were destroyed uh, by the Russians, um, apparently. And so... Mm -hmm. um, in tracking that some people have been posting with the image like i took this picture today i'm at this location at this time so despite the fact that the metadata is being stripped if you look at the actual tweet itself um it'll actually tell you you know that information again you're trusting the source of who posted it but if you get a couple people posting it um with with similar information but you know slightly different times things like that you can start to really kind of validate that data is pretty legitimate, you know? Um, so there, there can be kind of a scoring behind it too. But the key point being is, you know, if I put all of those dots on a map of all the posts around the different tanks of the where, when, you know, what, and all of that, you'll start to see clusters of it. And it becomes a, a good source of truth in terms of the movements, what's being targeted, what happened when, all of that, so. Yeah, and as you sit back and just think about it, I mean, what what conflict or war in history ever have we even really had this type of, of information and access to this type of information? Um, I mm -hmm. mean, it's a lot of stuff. I mean, where the average person who's in OSINT can start tracking troop movements where the media doesn't even have a clue at this point, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing yeah. how far uh, techniques and investigative methods have come along. 
times. Yeah. I mean, just most simply, like you don't have to be there in person, you right. know, um, this data is being shared with the world. And so, you know, you can take that and, and make intelligent sense of it and, and use it to do predictive analysis, use it to kind of track, you know, um, herds of, of troops, all, all kinds of interesting things. I mean, there's certainly a lot of really cool data points you can get from it. I mean, we've always had disinformation for a long time. I mean, you know, dating back to World War One and World War Two, right, there was tons of disinformation, you know, um, and, and even, you know, within Russia now, um, the disinformation, they're, you know, spreading allegedly to, you know, their own citizens, right? So. Yeah, it, so, so crazy. Um, and, you know, discerning, you know, again, I, I try to keep the middle road, obviously, um, you know, we, we all have biases by nature, just being human in, in, in where we live, the, the way we think, the way we were raised. But, you know, it's always like, okay, where is the disinformation coming from? Which is the disinformation? Because mm -hmm. you have to have some type of baseline or at least a volume of one side or another to determine that type of information. Would, would, would that be accurate to say? Yeah. Um, one of the things I've learned over the years doing a lot of research in that, and we have um, another OSINT um, enhancement and tool that we um, just uh, tested, is having the ability to um, kind of map those out. Um, people have always mapped out relationships of accounts to one another and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff, but having the additional ability to track um, what has changed with the account over time. Um, it was proven during COVID and, and even prior that if you're monitoring certain accounts that are either bots or being weaponized to spread disinformation, that the background, the person's name, all of those things many times change as that you know Twitter account is weaponized in different ways. Mm -hmm. So if you're monitoring that account on an ongoing basis and you see those changes occur, it's a, it becomes an even higher probability that this is either a bot or a weaponized account. And it was used prior to spread, you know, fake COVID information is now being used to spread fake, you know, uh, Ukrainian information or whatever. Right. And, and th that can be really important, you know, data as well. So um, being able to profile those, um, you know, is challenging, but, but there is uh, the ability to do it and we've proved it out. So. Yeah. Um, and it, do you see the challenges even more so with, with being able to track this disinformation? Because, I mean, just last year, maybe two years ago, we were dealing with essentially a, just a couple mainstream social media platforms, right? And, you know, obviously with the, the differences of people's viewpoints and opinions, people are splitting off from those because they, they feel they're not getting heard or maybe their information isn't being. But now you have uh, several new ones just in the last few months. Um, that, you know, I, I joined right away. As soon as I see a new social net network, I'm, I'm joining it just because I want to see what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's obviously competing ones now to even YouTube in the video service realm. Um, but you have uh, services. I'm going to try to remember all the names of these things so that it's been so many over the last few months, um, like uh, like Parler, right? It, it, it mm -hmm. went one way and then got shut down and now is back up somewhere else, no more the main CEO guy. Anyway, it, it's hard to keep track. And then I know uh, Truth Social Trump's uh, one that's out. Um, mm -hmm. There's uh, Getter. There's I'm naming all these crazy ones that are out there because literally if I hear about it, I'm going and signing up for it. But I see, mm -hmm. and it's funny, do you see this getting worse in the ability to spread disinformation a, a lot easier? Because you know, some of the mainstream networks were maybe trying to curb it and maybe some of their tactics were, were good or bad. You guys decide on that. We're, we're not here to do that. But um, do you see it getting worse with some of these other networks that are out there and people are splitting off from the mains? And now I'm seeing a lot of the same information from one to the next. And mm -hmm. they're really worded almost identical. It's pretty amazing how, how that happens. Yeah, um, it, I mean, absolutely. I mean, data lives everywhere now. And, you know, now that we've got you know, um, an exponential growth in all these other, you know, social networks that are, are smaller, but garnering people's attention, um, you know, is, you know, the, the further, you know, ability to spread this different disinformation in a variety of ways. So trying to monitor that, you know, becomes, you know, increasingly difficult because now 
the methods by which you do that vary based on each one of those social networks mm -hmm. um, and whether or not they expose APIs, ways in which you can scrape it from the site, you know, things like that, or, or the mobile app. I mean, you know, one of the things that was interesting was way back when I was doing research, you know, is looking at Facebook, but then Instagram and Instagram, Instagram is very mobile app oriented. So trying to do that direct through how you would access Instagram through a browser, which is almost non-existent today is really, really difficult. So, you know, all of those present a variety of challenges um, going forward. So, yeah. And I know a couple of those that I mentioned are uh, one of them is specifically is iOS only currently um, mm -hmm. kind of like, like ours for the moment, just because I can't figure Google out. Um, but I think <laughs> theirs is by design that way. And you can't, there's no, you're not, I, I don't know of a creative way to be able to scrape that. I'm sure someone uh, has come up with something. Um, Sam had, mm -hmm. a, had an interesting point here. Oop, I don't know why these keep going off center here. It says the internet is so huge, people can choose their own reality, which is really probably the best statement I've heard in a while. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's so very true. Mike, I, you know, we were wondering, you know, about the time is like, are we going to have, we going to, you know, is this going to go too quick, too long? And sure enough, I mean, I can't believe it's, we've been at an hour already. It's, and I, don't I know, know, right? Yeah, it went by really quick. Um, so I'm going to give everyone, uh, I, I forgot to ask again for questions. So if you got any questions for Mike, anything, um, you know, you can reach him at, uh, Mike at silent signals.com. You can ask a question here real quick, but Mike, before you go anywhere, and I want to kind of show everyone else this because we just got these in and, uh, this has kind of been a, a thought of mine for some time. Most of you guys know, and man, I don't know what I did with this thing. See, I throw all my notes all around. There it is <clears throat> on here. And. You know, obviously, we started with, uh, oops, hang on, i got to hide my face, otherwise it will focus there, our business card, which is essentially my face and a, and a QR code, right? Um, and we finally got to the point now where we, we give our guests standardly one of these, which um, I, don't, I don't think you have one of these yet, um, but uh, I'll make sure you do, because you're going to be at Techno, yeah? I will, yeah. yeah. Yep, so I'll I'm going to steal you at Techno. So this is just a, a, a shaved down uh, uh, shell casing from an A10 Warthog. Um, oh, so that's awesome. it's actually a shot glass and it comes with a certificate that is actually fired out of an A10 Warthog. It's a training round. So no, no way. I make sure I say that all the time. Yeah, it's down there. Actually, they get these from your neck of the woods. I think it's down in Georgia is the, is the training ground for these things. Oh, wow. Um, Maybe in Augusta. Yeah. I'm not sure where it's at down there, but they buy them yeah. in bulk, uh, from there and Hey, Sam's going to be down there too, but I'm going to also show you awesome. this, um, because we've just got these in. I'm going to again, cover my face. It's our new challenge coin here that has a cyber social hub on this. So I'll get you one of these guys here. And then on the back side here, if I can keep it in focus, yeah, see if it sees my eye, it's going to focus on that. These crazy new cameras. Um, come on, come on. I don't see my eye. Anyway, it says on, on the back of this thing, it's just not going to play nice. Let's try it again. There we go. Hey, I can right. attest it's really just, cool. <laughs> just got to keep it here. Um, and it, it says digital investigator around the edges. I know it's probably hard to see in some of the lighting here on there. And it's got binary code uh, surrounding this uh, this logo here in the middle, which is very cool. These things are pretty heavy and they're, they're pretty awesome uh, challenge coins that we have. So I'll get to make sure you get one of those uh, as well for kind of hanging out on the show. So thank you very much. And you're going to be on the show viral down in, in Myrtle beach, right? You're going to, I'm going to. Yeah. To yeah. Happy to. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That'll be exciting and looking forward to it. We had a great time uh, last time we were out there. So yeah, it should be, it should be a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to look real quick for any questions. I don't see anyone. Sam says he'll see you at techno as well. Um, cause he's awesome. going to be there and, uh, let me do a quick search for that, uh, Q colon, which nobody uses. Everyone just asks us questions anyway. <laughs> All right. So we got you. So again, um, you guys can reach Mike at Mike at silentsignals.com. I'll put some additional notes in the, in the show notes of how to his website, things like that. Cause I don't, I don't think I did in, in this particular case. And I apologize. I'll make sure I get that up, um, in the description of, of this video. If you guys are watching after the fact, um, I'll do it. So Mike, hang out, don't go anywhere here real quick, but everyone else, thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, yeah, thank you for who's ever hitting the like button. I see it going off over there. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. It helps with YouTube's algorithm. Um, join Cyber Social Hub. It's absolutely free. Just cybersocialhub.com. Uh, come over there. Great resources. All of it's free, always for you guys. Um, and we'll see you again next week. So uh, thank you guys very much. And, uh, and we'll see you guys then. Thanks again, Mike. Stay right there. Don't go anywhere. Thanks, everyone.